Thank you, Dr. Narayan, for joining us today. We have a small group of participants and our professional lunch series is rather small so that our participants can get an intimate uh, knowledge and experience at learning about our panelists' career trajectory. So uh, Dr. Narayan, can you please introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Right, so first of all, thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Macaulay. Thank you uh, to the CSM manager, i.e. Anne. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Chrisman, for this uh, invitation. And I never lose an opportunity if anyone invites me to share whatever little experience uh, I have. Uh, I am you know, Prakash. Uh, I am the VP of uh, pre VP for preclinical research at Anjon Biomedical Corp. We are a research and development uh, organization. We just went public about a month ago. And our R&D site is in Uniondale, uh, which is just outside of uh, Nasa County. And then we have a presence, a corporate presence is in uh, San Francisco and our uh, clinical headquarters is in Boston. As VP preclinical uh, research, I essentially am responsible for the daily activities uh, that happen at our R&D site. So that typically includes uh, uh, discovery uh, research, uh, preclinical research, some amount of chemistry, because the business that we are in is to bring out, uh, is to bridge areas of uh, unmet uh, medical need. Uh, so we have a presence uh, in addressing acute kidney injury renal uh, transplantation secondary to, uh, uh, sorry, graft failure secondary to renal transplantation. We have also a clinical trial ongoing in uh, pulmonary uh, disease secondary to the COVID uh, pandemic, pand uh, secondary to COVID infections. Uh, so all this involves a lot of uh, preclinical activity that uh, uh, basically precedes a lot of the clinical trials. And uh, that's what I uh, oversee at our R&D site. Okay, thank you, Doctor. And, and can you tell us or walk us through what a typical day looks like for you as Vice President of Preclinical Research at Anjan? Yes. So first of all, uh, to the participants here, I must say, and uh, it's a very exciting time just to be around. Uh, you know, we believe it or not, we are in the midst of a revolution. So we have all read about uh, the cultural revolution. We have read about the industrial revolution, uh, going even back uh, Stone Age, the Bronze Age and all that. So believe it or not, we are in the midst of one such uh, revolution. Uh, I don't know what it's going to, it's called as of now, but uh, future uh, historians probably will call it the IT or information or technology software type of revolution. And uh, the reason uh, I am digressing a little bit, but I just wanted to squeeze in these remarks here. Uh, the reason it's a uh, very exciting time to be around is because so much is happening. I would say going back the last uh, 25, 30 years since uh, use of the internet, a widespread use of the internet. And then uh, after that, the whole uh, dot-com revolution followed by uh, smartphones and now uh, social media. Of course, a lot of that has, uh, has negative ramifications, but I think uh, if you use it well, uh, we can uh, make, and we have made a lot of uh, advances. And today, uh, AI, ML, machine learning, uh, data science, those are all uh, making huge impacts across a number of, uh, number of uh, disciplines. What a uh, little bit about my trajectory, uh, the reason I uh, forwarded it uh, with this little monologue is because uh, 30, 35 years ago when I was starting out, uh, you know, you had literally three options. You go for science or math, and that was what it was called. You go for medicine or you go into uh, what is called the arts or commerce back then. So those were the three or four, four different options. And uh, there was no granularity there. Okay, So you learned um, uh, just everything under a rather broad uh, brush under science and math. 
uh, you learn everything under a broad brush in medicine and uh, the same thing in, uh, in the arts. Uh, I did my undergraduate in science. I have a Bachelor of Science from uh, Mumbai University, which is in India. Then I took a doctorate, a PhD from the Ohio State University at Columbus, Ohio. Followed that up with a uh, one or two postdoctoral st uh, stints at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then uh, University of Kentucky in Lexington. Uh, so I completed my postdoc there, which is basically an apprenticeship, uh, ship, if you will. So if you're in uh, medical school, uh, the equivalent would be, uh, you know, interning in a, in a clinic or a hospital type of setting. So that's what uh, we do. We intern as uh, scientists and that the term used for that is postdoc. So it's a, almost a rite of passage. So I did that. And then I got my one and only job, if you will, at uh, Anjan Biomedica Corp about uh, 19, 20 years ago. Career uh, trajectory was uh, very, very traditional. And that's basically reacting to what was the options out there. So we did not have the options uh, uh, that are available today. As I said, uh, you have one, three, four different options and you basically, uh, I would say partly you're forced into that due to parental pressure and the other is you like it. So between those two, I went into science and uh, that's where I, uh, I still am and I've enjoyed the ride. Okay, thank you, doctor. And, and you know, you mentioned that uh, for the most part, Angian has focused on, you know, like acute kidney disease, but I'm curious about how COVID-19 has affected your roles as VP of preclinical pre research. And have you or your team at Angian worked on any research projects relating to COVID-19? And if you could share more about that. Yes, yeah, so I mean, that's a great question. It's very timely, it's very topical, and it's almost uh, a never ending topic. We had hoped, um, last, <laughs> Someone was to be believed last Easter, COVID was going to go away, but here it is this, this Easter and COVID is alive and well, blossoming. So I, there are several components to our reaction to COVID uh, from the lens of the company and from uh, my own lens. Initially, obviously there was a super widespread panic. Uh, uh, we pretty much shut down operations in the sense that uh, we just had uh, so our, our uh, site is like a, is a biomedical site. So there are some things that really need some amount of maintenance, just bare maintenance, bare minimum maintenance. So we had one or two people going in, you know, once or twice a week uh, during that early part of the uh, epidemic. I'm talking about March, April, May of uh, last year. And just making sure, you know, things are just functioning uh, at a bare minimum level. So our operations were pretty much shut down uh, back then and we were in uh, maintenance mode. Uh, somewhere around uh, mid-May of last year, uh, that's when we started bringing back people in, but in a, well, you know, this A and B type of cohorts, okay? So that uh, happened even in our uh, company and we were all learning uh, best practices from one another. Whether, uh, whether it's from the schools, we borrowed from you know, high schools, learning from them, how they bring students back in, uh, you know, A and B cohort. And we pretty much did the same thing. We actually had a C cohort that came in on the weekends only. Our facility is fairly large as, as, as I know. Um, so social distancing wasn't that much of a challenge, uh, you know, especially if there are only five or six people coming in. The facility itself is about 30,000 square feet. Uh, so that wasn't an issue. Back then, uh, again, I'm talking about uh, May of last year, we were heavily, you know, masked up gowns, uh, you know, whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and uh, uh, we started operations on a, you know, much more guarded basis. Okay, the most uh, important studies, they took priority and we pretty much shelved uh, everything else. Certainly, we are not unique. I mean, uh, we are blessed that we didn't uh, lose anybody to the uh, uh, epidemic at our end. So in that sense, we are extremely blessed. Uh, we, of course, learned of infections. Uh, colleagues, friends, and family did have infections. But fortunately for us, there was nobody that was uh, impacted uh, health-wise. The operations, of course, was on a 
you know, on a very high priority basis, only some things got uh, started, whereas uh, other things were pretty much shelved uh, because of the COVID. Uh, we did qualify for a little bit of, uh, I mean, we got some sukers handout from the government back then, uh, but we were very fortunate in that our leadership was able to keep employment. Every one of us is still employed uh, during and past that uh, early phase of the uh, epidemic. So none of us uh, thankfully lost our jobs. So this was May of last year, and I think starting around end of summer of last year, fall, I wouldn't say we got immune to the epidemic. We just, you know, figured out the new normal, figured out what uh, needs to be done, what has to be done. And we are not alone. The whole world was with us. And I think we just uh, started to ramp up operations. So in terms of an operational standpoint, that's how we uh, reacted to the, the epidemic. Right now, we are again uh, full force, but we have, you know, all the full precautions, uh, a thermal scan, masks, a questionnaire before coming in, uh, all of that stuff. In terms of addressing the uh, epidemic, what can we do uh, to directly address the epidemic uh, in addition to maintaining best practices and making sure we're not uh, spreading the uh, virus? Uh, so the COVID pandemic, the COVID epidemic itself has two components, all right? So one is the infectious part where you get infected with the virus. And the early efforts, and we just bore fruit a few months ago, the early efforts were at finding vaccines, how to reduce the viral titer, how to reduce the load, okay? We are really not in that business. We are not into infectious diseases. Uh, so we really didn't have too much to contribute at uh, that end in terms of reducing uh, the viral uh, load. So a lot of that, uh, those efforts were centered around, you know, vaccines, uh, small molecule therapeutics, um, different types of masks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, there was, I remember this, there was some uh, technology where I think the mask pretty much tells you it, it turns red if you have a fever. And so different uh, things were happening back then in terms of both uh, prevention and then as well as uh, uh, therapeutics and reducing the viral load. We didn't have a presence there, but what we have a presence now, and, and you can see that on, uh, on our website, anjohn.com, you are all familiar with uh, the term long hauler, right? So just because you got past the uh, initial stage of that uh, uh, infection, uh, people, uh, it's well known now that for months together or even years, people have continuing uh, phenotypes. They have uh, kidney problems, they have lung problems, all kinds of different uh, uh, problems and they are called uh, long haulers, okay? So those uh, problems or the sequelae, if you will, of the initial infection has not uh, uh, left them, unfortunately. So we do have a clinical trial, it's ongoing in uh, Brazil. This is for uh, post-COVID acute uh, uh, respiratory disease. So anybody that was infected with COVID uh, that went into a hospital and was uh, placed on a ventilator. Uh, we have a uh, medication that we are trying in that population. Uh, it's the same medication that we try uh, for people, for patients with acute kidney injury. It's basically a cytoprotective agent. Uh, Preclinically, it has worked in several animal models of uh, lung injury. So we thought, hey, the, the folks that uh, are still surviving the, the infection, but their uh, lungs are pretty much in uh, despair. Uh, they're on ventilators and they can, uh, you know, uh, get long-term scarring, uh, et cetera. We have a uh, therapeutic that we are trying in a phase two trial in Brazil. So this is, and you can look it up. It's an Anjon sponsored trial with our, our drug, looking at that population that's in the hospital in the, uh, uh, critical care unit, uh, probably on ventilators uh, that are presenting with pulmonary uh, uh, pulmonary impairment. So that's how I think we are trying to contribute directly uh, in a positive way to the COVID epidemic. If this uh, trial is a success, then a lot of the patients that survived that initial uh, phase but had uh, long-term pulmonary effects, uh, they would uh, benefit from uh, taking our medicine and would probably not need a lung transplant or wouldn't have to be on a ventilator for the rest of their lives. That's really great. It's, uh, I remember just from my own experience that 
you know, trying to get a transplant can take years. And a lot of the times patients might not have that much time. So I'm hoping to see, you know, really great results from Andrian's work. And kind of following that, you know, Dr. And what would you say is the most fulfilling and exciting part of your work? Is it getting to see, you know, the results or getting to work on trials like this that contribute directly to helping COVID-19? So fulfillment comes in a number of ways. Uh, for me, uh, I think the entire journey. So like I said, I have been in Anjon now close to 20 years. And Anjon, I wouldn't call it a mom and pop shop back then, but it was literally two small rooms at the, uh, uh, the Feinstein Institute. So that's part of what is called a Northwell Health. It's on Community Drive. So we were literally two rooms uh, there. We were like three and a half, four and a half uh, people working there. And we have come a long way to becoming a public company. Uh, a month ago, we have presence, presences in, uh, on Long Island, Boston and San Francisco. So that, that aspect of the journey itself was, uh, and being part of the journey and in, during the formative years, it's almost like you're, you're too young and, but it's, uh, uh, it's almost like seeing a child that, you know, from birth go, graduates and uh, goes on to college and becomes a successful individual as, you, as your parents, I'm sure, are experiencing today. So that aspect of uh, the journey itself uh, is very exciting. Uh, seeing Anjon blossom from, you know, literally six or seven people in two rooms to a uh, company that's being valued close to a billion dollars, that part is very exciting. The uh, current excitement also draws down from just interacting with my colleagues. Uh, I mean, I see uh, at least one person on here uh, from Anjon and uh, it's a very interactive, it's a very interactive atmosphere. You have uh, been through our, uh, our uh, halls. Uh, you have seen that it's a very give and take uh, atmosphere. There's a lot of uh, intellectual exchange there. A lot of things are happening and what you can get out of Anjon is a little different from a large company. You can actually see your idea go from an idea to a tangible asset. So uh, the, the drug that is currently in phase three and phase two clinical trials uh, in the United States and in Brazil, uh, that drug literally I saw that being born in many, many years ago in 2002, 2003, and today it's uh, hopefully going to get approved uh, multinationally for a number of uh, indications. So that, that aspect is very rewarding, very exciting, uh, and it's a tangible outcome. It's not just an idea that, hey, you know, we're just here uh, to earn a paycheck, but it's actually something that you can uh, uh, hopefully see patients across the uh, globe benefit. So that, that part is obviously very uh, exciting to see a tangible outcome of your work. That's amazing. Congratulations to you and Andrian for um, going public. And you know, I didn't realize how many years you had actually worked with Andrian. So that's, I'm sure that was a very fulfilling moment seeing how big it's grown. And what would you say is one skill, attribute or strategy that has helped you the most throughout your career or maybe you've seen has helped a lot of your colleagues in helping Anjan become what it is today? Great question. So from my, I think for me, being just dogged, pursuing something without giving it up, you know, it's almost like, uh, it's not the greatest analogy, but when a shark smells uh, blood. So I keep chasing something uh, until I have it or uh, I, I drop dead. So I think I'm very determined, very, uh, very dogged. I don't uh, uh, give up very easily. So if I set my eyes or, uh, you know, whatever on some target, I go out to great lengths to try to achieve it without uh, letting, you know, hurdles come. Everybody faces hurdles and it's part of the, part of the journey, but I don't give up uh, very easily. And I think, uh, for whatever little I am today, I think that has, that attribute has helped me uh, in uh, in good stead. And in fact, uh, there is a saying, right? Uh, science success is ninety nine percent perspiration and just one percent inspiration. So uh, I think that's an attribute that will hold will help uh, most people. In fact, uh, uh, very successful people out there they started 
mom and pop shops, right? Bill Gates and all those people, they had backdoor garages, but they kept pursuing uh, their goals. Uh, certainly, I'm not in that same league, but uh, whatever little I am today, I think a lot of that has happened uh, due to a pursuit uh, of whatever I want uh, without uh, giving up too easily. Yes, that's definitely something uh, a lot of us need right now, especially as we're pushing through you know, virtual learning and virtual webinars and such. And what is something that you wish more people knew about the health science and medical industry, maybe in addition to just you know, pushing through and consistently being determined to move forward and persisting? Right. So as far as the biomedical industry is concerned, I think it's, first of all, in the United States, it's very uh, regulated. It's highly regulated. Uh, so we have uh, an agency called FDA, Food and Drug Administration, that oversees all our activities. There is an equivalent agency in the Europe called the EMA that act, uh, oversees uh, act, drug development act, activities in Europe. And other countries have their uh, uh, respective agencies. So it's a very uh, a regulated climate. It, there are no real shortcuts. And part of that is because uh, we are not really into, we are not in, drugs are not cosmetics. So they are essentially life uh, saving uh, therapies, uh, not to be viewed as uh, cosmetics. So there is, there is that. Uh, most drugs, vaccines, whatever you have, they are artificially created. It's not like food. I mean, food also you're putting in your body, but food is more of a natural uh, resource that you may have, you know, modulated a little bit through cooking or whatever. But drugs are essentially an art, completely artificial uh, uh, product, a completely synthetic product. So the bar is very high in terms of uh, uh, imbibing that, putting it into your body, either, uh, you know, orally, intranasally, dermally, uh, or, or whatever, whatever you have. So that is something that I think uh, uh, people uh, don't recognize. And I think one of the reasons drugs are so expensive in the United States, and I'm certainly for bringing those prices down, but uh, the reason drugs are so expensive is because the hoops or the bars that the hurdles that we have to go through uh, and the number of failures that accompany each success story, uh, there has to be some return on all those investments. And uh, that's why markup prices are uh, uh, so high, uh, just because uh, that's the nature of the game. We spend millions of dollars trying to bring a drug to clinical trials. Uh, 99 out of 100 times we fail it, you know, it's toxic or it didn't meet the endpoints. Um, so when we do have a success story, we have to recuperate some of those lost uh, uh, dollars and uh, not just, uh, you know, opportunity to recuperate dollars. It's actually the cost of bringing that drug to the market. So that's something that um, a lot of people uh, uh, don't uh, recognize. And I just wanted to highlight that given this opportunity. That's really interesting. It never really dawns upon a lot of consumers, maybe how much goes into the back end work of the research aspect. Certainly, I know that it takes hours, um, you know, with the scientists at the lab, and they really do spend a lot of time. And kind of going off of what you were saying, you mentioned how you are, you were a principal investigator on, you know, 27 NIH plus DOD and NSF and other grants. So could you tell us more about these projects and the grants and also your role as the principal investigator? Super. No, that's a great question. So those grants are essentially given by, not given out, they're not doled out uh, like charity, but uh, they are uh, grants from the US government. So the way it works is for, uh, one of the things that I like about the US government is uh, regardless of the, you know, your political leanings, they really s support small businesses. I think small businesses whether it's your you know, corner uh, bread shop or your uh, whatever, I think small businesses on Main Street, off Main Street, they are the, uh, the uh, bedrock of America. They employ many, many more uh, uh, people than even large industries. So we, the United States government through different uh, departments, whether it's the Department of Defense, uh, National Science Foundation, or the, uh, the NIH, which is the National Institute, Institutes of Health, Department of Human uh, Health and Human Services, the TSA, the Transportation uh, Agency, they all have uh, uh, money 
this is taxpayer money, of course, allotted to uh, supporting innovation uh, from via small business uh, companies such as ourselves. Uh, these are typically high risk, highly innovative endeavors that uh, a big pharmacy may not uh, support. So today, you know drones, right? Drones are everywhere, but the drone didn't just, you know, drop down from a tree. It was actually part of a highly innovative campaign, I think, from the NSF. The internet, there are so many different uh, success stories uh, uh, that uh, blossomed out of small businesses. So at Anjon Biomedica, when we were you know, much smaller during our formative uh, years, uh, to support some of our, or the majority of our operations or the entirety of our operations, uh, we would compete for small business innovative research grants. So these are grants that uh, you propose an idea, you have some data backing up that idea, and you want to build it, you want to uh, populate it with uh, you know, uh, meat rather than just it being uh, an idea. So what you do is you write uh, a grant proposal to the NIH, for example, the National Institute of Health, saying, hey, I have this for kidney disease, I think this will work because this, 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 and I think this is better than dialysis uh, because dialysis is pretty much a straight, it's, it's a great invention, but it is a straight jacket. It's very, it's very, uh, it's associated with a lot of morbidity. So we have drugs that can avert the need for dialysis. So you write, you write that uh, that uh, grant application to the NIH, and if it's funded, so it's very competitive. They look at several such uh, applications from different people. Uh, the government looks at its priorities. Is dialysis, kidney disease, a priority? Uh, right now. So I'll give you a great example. What was the number one health priority the last year onwards? What was the number one health crisis? COVID. There you go. So the government of the United States and the globe spent billions of dollars on COVID because that was that is the thing. So 20 years back, uh, we would apply for kidney disease, heart disease, lung disease. And uh, depending on, uh, part of it was depending on, is that a health crisis? It certainly is. Of course, it, it gets uh, you know, backstaged by more emergent crises, but uh, we would apply for these grants. And once we got these grants, we would actually embark on them. So the way, when I say embark on them is we would, our chemistry team would discover or invent a new uh, molecule which has drug-like properties. And uh, our mission was to screen that through all the hoops so to screen that through bio biological assays, these are cell culture assays in vitro to look at um, um, preclinical in vivo models of pharma, you know, PK, pharmacokinetics, safety, toxicology, and efficacy. So those are the, uh, those are the activities that were funded uh, through NIH grants. And what you see today, if you look at our clinical trials page on anjohn.com, you will see a drug that has essentially come fully out of NIH funded, uh, of the NIH funded uh, uh, SBIR program. So that's uh, ANG 3777. It's uh, right now in three different clinical trials. So it came out of that. There is another, uh, another drug called ANG 3070 uh, that is just completed a first in human trial. That's like a phase one safety trial that came fully out of the NIH and the Department of Defense. So that drug, which we are going to be uh, trying in uh, kidney disease patients that came out of the NIH and the DOD, these grants. So as a, as a principal investigator, my job is to take the money and put it to good use to screen our drug candidates, to look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats uh, uh, for those drug candidates to see if it works in preclinical models. How does it fare against the competition? Is it safe? So to take it through all the preclinical hoops uh, and then uh, submit it, uh, submit it to uh, uh, clinical trials. And uh, we have been fortunate in that we have uh, been able to use taxpayer dollars uh, uh, back when we were getting them uh, to uh, bring uh, 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 several compounds to clinical trials for kidney, acute kidney injury, chronic kidney disease, as well as COVID-related ARDS. That's awesome. It's a uh... It's, it's just very amazing how far it's come from, you know, NIH funding to just how big Angen has grown. And now that there are all of these drugs that are actually on the market and well, in the trial phases, I should say. So kind of 
basing off of you know the grants and how a lot of these organizations like I didn't realize that the DOD or even the TSA provided funding to helping research and smaller businesses. Are there any clubs, associations, or organizations that you think students should join if they're interested in the health sciences and medical industry? And if applicable, have you been a part of any clubs or association and how has your membership impacted your career? Absolutely, a great question. So uh, I'll just tell you something. I was uh, last, Last year, just before COVID, I was at a math conference in uh, Denver with my kid. And it, I thought it would, you know, lack of a better word, geeky, you know, a nerdy conference, math only, equations here and there. But they had a, they had a floor where uh, they had the commercial aspects of that, of that uh, conference or of that body of knowledge. And I was flabbergasted to see how much math gets used. So one of the big things back then, COVID still wasn't big back then, I'm talking of February of last year, is uh, the mathematics of uh, uh, diseases. So how do diseases spread? So the CDC in Atlanta and other places, they actually use math models and they're using that for COVID uh, to see how fast uh, diseases spread, how do they cluster, what are the, you know, uh, uh, the groupings that and the associations events that cause uh, diseases to spread. That's, so that's huge as far as uh, epidemiology is concerned. It's very big. So that's one aspect of where math can be uh, useful. The other aspect I was very surprised is uh, the uh, NSC, uh, National Security, I forget what it's called. They use a lot of that for breaking code or creating code. So, you know, all these passwords that, that, you, that you get. Those are actually com that uses a lot of uh, combinatorial uh, combinatorial uh, mathematics. So that's that's uh, there. As far as the health sciences are concerned, uh, there are may many many more opportunities. Uh, you can get a whiff of that through the clubs that you can join. So I'll just rattle off some uh, names that may be of interest. One is the American uh, Triple uh, Triple AS. So that's just the basic uh, uh, science academy. But there's a lot of uh, good information there, what's happening, uh, what is topical, what is timely. Uh, so the AAAS is a great place. The AHA, the American uh, Health Heart Association, uh, the American Society of Nephrology, the ASN, the American uh, Neurological Association, uh, Polycystic Kidney Disease Organization, uh, NASA, you can all join these. Uh, the two, two things. One, as a student, your fee is literally zero dollars okay so my kid went to that meeting for i think she paid ten dollars somebody like me i had to pay thousand fifty dollars because i'm part of corporate america and i'm not a student anymore so students are at a great advantage to join uh, some of these clubs etc for literally a throwaway a throwaway price of uh, zero dollars to five dollars to ten dollars a lot less than your uh, cell phone bill and uh, and then uh, the other aspect of this is beyond the science and what's what's new and exciting out there by joining these clubs such as uh, or organizations such as AAAS, AHA, ASN, uh, etc., is networking. It's a great resource to see, uh, you know, who else has shared uh, shared objectives or where you might find an area where you can uh, utilize your uh, expertise. Who is uh, looking for you? Who are you looking for? Um, so in a, in a sense, it's, it's your, um, the social media networks where, uh, you know, people uh, uh, go to find uh, dates or whatever. So this is a scientific uh, dating club, if you will, where you can uh, actually find uh, a lot of information, uh, jobs. There are actually messaging boards out there where people uh, uh, put in, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so. Uh, 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 job. So th that's a great opportunity by uh, joining, the, joining these clubs, and it's literally free. Thank you, Dr. Narayan. We'll hopefully be able to share some of the clubs and associations you mentioned uh, in a follow-up email with our students and anybody else who wasn't able to make it but might still be interested. So another question I had for you was, so you've mentioned before that you've served as a mentor to STEM students. Could you talk to us more about your role as a mentor and your experience? Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, so 
I think my first student, uh, it, uh, she was a referral, you know, friend's friend back in 2008. Uh, that led to the next student and that led to two other students. And uh, uh, so the program really took off, I would say in 2008. Uh, since then, uh, the program has really blossomed into a Long Island wide, maybe even New Jersey, Queens, New York City program, where we take in a lot of high school students. And uh, excuse me, one moment, okay, one moment. While we wait for uh, Dr. Ryan to come back, you might want Sorry, to start I, I, formulating I, your Q&A questions. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Ryan. Yes, feel free to throw in your question in the chat and I will share uh, those club names via email. So the uh, up until last year, we, because of COVID, we pretty much had to put the brakes on the program. Even this year, the brakes are on, but uh, we typically had students coming in from a lot of local high schools. So students like uh, Anne, her friends at that time, uh, these are ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders who are interested in, in uh, STEM. We would assign them a project, a lot of reading, a lot of doing, a lot of interpretation of the data, and they would be able to put together stories for uh, uh, local competitions, regional competitions, as well as uh, national competitions such as ISEF, LICEF, uh, JSHS, uh, Region Ron, et cetera. We would also host uh, students from university. So these were typically farm, pharmacy students, uh, students that were pre-med, uh, that had an interest in uh, bolstering their resume, that had an interest in actually uh, working in a, this is not to say that, uh, uh, so the academics, um, I'm, I'm a product of academia, but it's a little bit of a bubble environment. Uh, once you come outside, you will see, you know, uh, uh, what the uh, outside environment looks like. So the students that were PharmD majors, that were uh, pre-med majors, they were able to get a feel for the book knowledge that they were getting. How do you reduce that to uh, practice? How do you reduce that to clinical practice or a pharmaceutical practice? So they learned a lot. Um, so the, uh, the advanced students, they learned a lot about formulations, they learned about drug delivery, they started to learn about uh, uh, dosing schedules, etc. Uh, I'll be, this was in animals, but they were able to put, uh, you know, they, oh, this is why I learned this in school. Uh, so that I think they enjoyed that experience. I would say 90% of my students are published, they have, including Anne, uh, they have uh, peer reviewed uh, publications, uh, either first author or a shared first author or a middle author. So there's a tangible outcome again uh, of their endeavors. So not only they, do they present in front of a board, in front of their peers, but uh, they also have something that uh, you know the name is set in stone, um, and they're on uh, they're on publications. Uh, so it's I think it's a very at least from my perspective, I enjoy interacting with students. I learn a lot. In fact, uh, the students know what is uh, current right now. Uh, I'm, I am, uh, last year or so, I have joined the wonderful world of bioinformatics. And I think that actually came off uh, one of my students who introduced me to this, uh, to this field. So other than the, this past year and this year, because of COVID, I think summers, Anjon has been a hub. It's kind of like a, a, a temple, if you will, a, 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 uh, for uh, research. Uh, a lot of students across the island and the tri-state area both high school as well as uh, college and uh, even uh, uh, farm D students, uh, uh, they have come through our doors, spent uh, several weeks uh, with us, amongst us, uh, you know, learning uh, not just uh, uh, skills, but also interacting with some of the uh, scientists. And a lot of the research they do is at Anjon is at the PhD or doctorate level. It's very advanced. So they get a flavor of, okay, is that something I need to pursue or, you know, I'm not interested in this. I want to go to something else. So they are able to make a more informed choice uh, by uh, spending some time at uh, Anjon. And a uh, lot of the high school students, I'm not boasting here, but they have gone to premier institutions such as the Macaulay, et cetera. Uh, I would like to think in small part due to uh, their time at Anjon. 
Yes, thank you, Dr. And my time at Angian has definitely helped me a lot to get to where I am and of course you as well. So thank you for that. And with that said, uh, it is 11, well, it's 11.46 now and I would like to open up to our students if they have any questions. I believe there was one question in the chat box already. Um, sorry, my chat box just disappeared. So I can read it out. It's, okay. uh, are you familiar with any specific pre-clinical internships that undergrads can apply for? So the main, uh, the, the main uh, I won't call it a drawback, but a challenge uh, for, for the undergrad versus the high school is a lot of the undergrads, they expected a paycheck from by working or rotating through our doors. Uh, the high school student, he or she is more, uh, you know, there for the competition for trying to get into a good college. Uh, so they would work for free. But my understanding is uh, to answer Svetlana's question is uh, there are two category categories of uh, internships uh, for undergrads. One is a paid internship and one is an unpaid internship. I don't know the new uh, rules. I think New York State actually requires now people to get paid something for an internship. But back then, we were not able to offer uh, money. So all our internships were unpaid. But there are several uh, several uh, corporations, small and big, that actually uh, uh, reimburse you for your activities. So they, it's not you're not going to become a millionaire through a summer uh, internship, but they will pay you enough that, you know, hey, you take something uh, back home in your pocket. Am I familiar with that? I think you can just uh, be familiar with some names. Yeah, I, a lot of the universities that, um, you know, I toured for my kid, uh, they they would uh, partner you with uh, uh, corporations, uh, uh, you know, regional, local corporations that would actually uh, allow to have uh, summer interns. So I would check with uh, the Macaulay program, as, uh, you know, Macaulay Honors College, see if they have partnerships. Uh, a lot of these corporations, they like uh, what, for lack of a better word, feeder schools, okay? So they like, uh, they come to, you know, the local university college and they say, hey, we are looking for some interns. It's worked out great in the past. Uh, can you, do you have some, uh, you know, fresh blood coming through? Uh, so there's, there's that partnerships that you can, um, you can uh, uh, dip into. As far as uh, other opportunities, you just, uh, you know, Google away. So look up companies, a lot of them have an outreach uh, outreach tab or community service for giving back to the community, outreach, et cetera. Uh, look through those uh, local company tabs and see if they are offering, uh, you know, summer internships, whether they will reimburse you for your activity. And John, while it didn't give you monetary uh, compensation, I think uh, what our students and hopefully Anne will agree is uh, we had some other uh, non-monetary assets uh, that the students, we have, we have a certificate, we have a recommendation letters that we can give out. And then uh, also uh, you know, publications, competitions in, uh, in different, uh, 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 different uh, fields that the students could, uh, would benefit from, uh, uh, but we won't necessarily pay them. So yes, so uh, Google away, look for uh, internships. Again, the, the biggest challenge has been COVID. Uh, we are all working remotely. So that has really changed, uh, you know, actually on-site internships. It's uh, also leveraged some fields better than others. People that are in IT uh, using software, they are really not as much affected as uh, people uh, who dip their hands in blood and guts. So that's uh, a little bit more of a challenge. So COVID has taken its toll uh, in terms of uh, opportunities and internships also, but uh, uh, do Google away and I'll, I'll do some uh, searching myself and I'll uh, put this into an email uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, I'll put this also into an email uh, along with those uh, uh, associations slash clubs that I'm gonna write about. Yes, thank you, Dr. And, and to quickly add in here, uh, since we are the Macaulay Career Development, here's a little, shameless plug, but you guys can also look through Career Path or we have our wonderful Gia and Jamie. They're so helpful in terms of resources. So if you ever wanna set up an appointment, they would be more than happy to help you to find something that might be of your interest. And of course, through um, Career Path, if you're not signed up on that already. And uh, just speaking of events tomorrow, I'm sorry, not tomorrow, tomorrow, Saturday. Um, it, there's actually an upcoming graduate 
graduate school fair for Macaulay Pre-Health. It's a virtual graduate school fair that's coming up on April 23rd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So a lot of colleges will be at that event if you're interested in learning more. I'm sure they might have someone or something there that might be able to further direct you to something else too. So I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat box as well. Um, but if anybody else also has any questions, you please feel free to just unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. And if not, I can also go ahead and ask another question. So and I just wanna add one more thing on, the, on this topic of internships. I think the most important uh, component is to get that first foot in. Okay, in through that door. I think that's almost priceless if you can get that first foot in. And if that comes in the form of an internship, that's super awesome. So I think at this point uh, in your careers, you shouldn't really worry about, you know, is this fellow paying me $1 more than the next person? It's more about getting that first foot in. Uh, and uh, it's more like what can you bring to the organization than uh, uh, why the organization needs you? Uh, because uh, you at this point, point in your careers, you all need to prove yourselves. And I would, you know, relish any opportunity I would get, you know, if I was starting today to get that first foot in. And believe me, if as an intern, uh, from the company perspective, from the host perspective, I can tell you, if I like you, your work ethics, your productivity as an intern, I'm going to track you down and try to get you once you graduate as a full-time employee in my organization, right? So because I spend time, uh, uh, efforts, etc., investments on you, you of course also intern and you got something back. So you become a known, you become a known known, okay, in a few words of Don Rumsfeld, ex old defense secretary. You're a known known entity. So at that point, you become a something that the organization will ch try to chase down and offer a full-time job upon graduation. And I've seen several, uh, inter not so much at Anjon because we weren't quite there yet, but a lot of my colleagues, uh, kids, uh, they, they interned and hey, they are now full-time highly paid employees at their, uh, uh, at their firms that they intern. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Thank you, Doctor, and that's some really helpful uh, advice and information. Uh, does anybody at this point have any questions they would like to ask? No? Okay, so, uh, Svetlana says, thank you so much for this information. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and ask a question just so we keep the ball rolling. So Dr. Arndt, do you have any advice for current Macaulay students right now interested? I know you actually you know, did give out a lot of advice, but anything else you would like to give Macaulay students who are interested in pursuing a career in the health and medical field, or maybe specifically for any seniors who may be graduating in these uncertain times uh, in these fields? Yeah, I mean, the times, the one, well, the times are, of course, uncertain. They've always been uncertain because, uh, like I say, uh, the time when you're in kindergarten through primary school, elementary school, middle school, high school, through college, it's uh, more of a sheltered environment, right? Nobody has much expectations out of you other than, you know, get good grades, uh, attendance, do well in school. But once you, once you start entering the junior, senior year of college, uh, you unless you want to continue getting a higher education, you are at uh, you're on the cusp of being pushed out into the big bad world. Okay, the workforce, and it's always a time of uncertainty for anybody. How that person would feel? What did they learn in college? Would is that enough to prepare them for uh, real life? And real life is also a lot of interpersonal, uh, you know, stuff that goes on beyond just doing whatever you, uh, you're doing. So are you fully prepared? So it, there's always some uncertain, some uncertainty there. What I like about being around now, being in your position uh, or in your all's position right now is the number of options. They may be a little confusing, but the number of options at my, uh, at your disposal. So today, you have options in bioinformatics, you have options in uh, imaging, you have options in uh, 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 machine learning, you have options in histopathology, you have, so just deep learning. So that is as far as uh, machine learning, information science, AI in the medical field. So this is beyond your traditional uh, uh, doctor role. There's so much more out there that you can tap into 
uh, and uh, you know utilize there is mechatronics which is a blend of uh, mechanical engineering and uh, electronics there are fields out there uh, disciplines out there that i haven't even heard of okay and i i would certainly be uh, excited to explore uh, any opportunities there so data science data information uh, in medicine okay most most medicine itself has has undergone a metamorphosis right so 40 50 years back the local physician the community physician uh, he or she would have a lot of what are called hand skills they would be able to diagnose just visually look you know or feeling the abdomen or whatever they had a lot of uh, hand skills that are pretty much not there today they, those hand skills they they transform to instruments so you go for imaging x ray mri ct scan and you know, you know blood work and you got diagnosed that way even that now is moving into something called data science or bioinformatics so your diagnosis will probably be made by somebody sitting or at or a computer uh, that will look at the data and then say hey you have this and this so i think it's very important for macaulay students to be cognizant of what is out there to predict or to you know inform yourselves of what is going to be really needed 5 7 10 years from now uh, is diagnostic radiology diagnostics etc is that a field that's going to be in need of human human uh, uh, humans say 10 years from now is that all going to be uh, driven by uh, machines so those are things that you need to be aware of you need to uh, react to uh, in the in the medical field okay oh, uh, uh, assistance at uh, age uh, you know uh, old age homes a uh, lot of that even today is actually live nurses but where the field is going not today not tomorrow but maybe 10 15 years from now is uh, robotics where you will have a butler who not only gets you Uh, what you want but also has soft skills who will cry with you who will laugh with you who will make you know laugh at your jokes so uh, where uh, neurology is and machine learning is going is to impart soft skills into robots that can emote with you so that's something that you need to be aware of if you are going to be work thinking about uh, you know being an assistant in an old age home uh, much needed today but 20 years from now that that thing may have gone away so inform yourselves there's a lot of opportunity opportunities out there as darwin said survival is not the strongest or you know the fastest it's the one that adapts so i think this is a great time uh, uh, to be around uh, to be available uh, it's a great time to look at your options react to those options and uh, adapt to them and of course i wish all of you uh, much success thank you dr nuray and that's very comforting i'm sure for a lot of our seniors and also students in general who are balancing you know their school and potential careers within the next few years so at this time uh, are there any other questions from the student panel if you have a question uh, please feel free to unmute yourself or drop it in the chat box um if not we will go ahead and wrap up as we are nearing the end of our session nope okay Uh, so I'll take the silence as there's no more questions. And Dr. An, you covered a lot of great topics in depth. So thank you so much. Um, this session was recorded, so we will be, and if that's okay with you, Dr. An, we will be sharing this with other students who maybe weren't able to join us live. And once again, thank you to Dr. An and all of our participants for joining us today. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email. So. look out for that and yeah thank you for joining and please do stay to take our quick questionnaire uh it helps us with understanding how we're conducting these sessions and webinars and we really value that super hey thank you and uh, great uh, seeing you speaking with you it had been you. a couple of years i uh, i really enjoy these uh, interactions you know that uh and all uh, everyone here and uh, uh, the macaulay co community at large i wish you the very best and uh, uh not that i wish it upon myself but uh, some day you may be treating you all may be, one of you may be treating me for something that i have so uh good luck and uh, uh you know up and away thank you doctor and have a great day and great weekend okay bye, -bye.